All right, welcome back. Two more lectures today on interdisciplinary teams. And then on Thursday, I'm gonna talk, I'm essentially just summarizing the class and depending on how far we get today, I wanna have a discussion about kind of the future of software engineering and machine learning together. Um, but before I start as usual, what do you remember from the last lecture? Can give you the safety keyword or the keyword safety. Does this ring any bell? No. We talked about self driving cars. I was surprised that nobody had more knowledge about self driving cars. Um, we repeated that hazard analysis and different forms of kind of looking at requirements, looking at risks are useful for understanding um, possible problems and designing for them. We very briefly talked about a couple of kind of traditional safety design techniques such as redundancies and, and think, think kind of monitor controllers, things like this. Anything else? Robustness also comes up here. I actually debated for quite a while whether I teach safety or security first and where to put robustness because it kind of is discussed for both. Um, and I also talked a little bit about kind of the importance of requirements that um, safety issues are often getting requirements wrong, right? Um, that machine learning prediction mechanisms are unreliable components um, that we need to think around that a lot of this is at system level. And then maybe the last part also that safety is not just for nuclear power plants and self-driving cars, right? So there's a broad range of safety issues that might not immediately kill people, but that might come up in everyday applications uh, where it's worth to think about safety. All right, today I wanna talk more about kind of the I started the, the class actually with this uh, discussion of data scientists on one side, software engineers on the other side, um, them having maybe different focus, different um, specialties and how we can, how we should bring them better together. And I wanna talk about teamwork today. I wanna focus mostly on this part, but also a bit of traditional teamwork strategies. Um, before I get there, I want to use one last case study um, that I want to use for discussion today. And um, even though I may not be able to use, reuse the TikTok case study in the fall because it has been banned or so, but let's assume that this is one of the very few social media uh, sites that have merged, right? So there's not really anything new in this space. So let's assume TikTok had a few scandals also, um, they had a case where somebody committed suicide live, while they're live tweeting this. They deleted the feed, but they only informed the authorities like many hours after they deleted things, things like this. So let's assume they want to do better, right? They want to do something for social good. Um, they want to detect depression, essentially. Um, let's assume they, but will you think about, so is anybody here using TikTok? Do you? Do you at least have a rough idea of what it is? Kind of social media side, uh, mostly movie sharing, I think, short movie snippets, um, known for an excellent recommendation algorithm, apparently. I, and that's also the extent of my knowledge, roughly. So, but let's take the idea that um, you want to detect depression, maybe other also other mental health problems. Um, and you might be able to do this with some form of sentiment analysis, kind of analyzing what kind of content people are writing, maybe um, look at what people who were diagnosed in the past have written. Um, and then you can think also about a bunch of interventions. For example, 
people who you consider may suffer from depression, maybe you want to show them slightly different content, right? Modify your ranking mechanism. Maybe you want to show them some ads for getting help, some instructions, um, something like this, right? Um, maybe you're specifically designing uh, small group features. This is something that has been studied a lot in kind of um, online interactions that kind of things escalate if you have big groups and anonymity, but kind of in smaller groups, you have much more healthy interactions. So if maybe if you find something where you only put like six or seven uh, users in a group or something like this and engage them this way. So there are all kinds of things that you can think about that you could do as a social media company um, if you can detect this. So let's assume you're, you're running some sort of machine learning to detect this on videos or you transcribe the videos and do this on the text or you use this on the images of the video. Um, they wanna be serious, let's assume about this. So they are working with mental health professionals um, as consultants and they uh, bring some machine learning researchers from some top universities into this who might help. And maybe just for context, um, when I look this up, the US side of TikTok has about 1400 employees. They're trying to hire like crazy. Um, and let's just assume, I have no idea, that they have about 300 developers and data scientists and the rest is doing other things, right? Do you have a sense that a project like this, how this might be doable, um, how you would approach this? Is this kind of realistic enough that we can talk about this more? Right, so we haven't talked about sentiment analysis specifically, that that's a form of natural language processing technique where you essentially try to pick up on words that are more positive or more negative to, it's traditionally trained on movie reviews or so whether from the text of the movie review, you can identify whether it's a positive or negative review, right? There are all kinds of these things that are trained also to detect hate speech and things like this. Um, so you could imagine that if we just have enough labeled text, like this is a text that a diagnosed depressed person produced in the past or self-proclaimed, right? Um, and here's some control text, you might be able to pick up on this with NLP techniques. And maybe there's also something uh, that you could do with uh, video data, um, right? And there's some professionals in, involved who might give you clues. We're coming back to this a couple of times. So again, as I said, I started the lecture kind of with this contrast of data scientists and software engineers, right? And I think, again, this is, overly simplified, but we talked about this a bunch of times, kind of painted data scientists, maybe as those people who have focused much more on the machine learning side, often kind of narrowly focused on accuracy and maybe prototyping of early things, kind of modeling. Um, and they focus mostly on, on kind of creating the model, not so much on deploying it typically, right? And the software engineer traditionally is kind of more of a system building person who, who deals with the reality of limited constraints and budgets and um, messiness of the real world. But you can break this down further. So this is, um, there are a couple of, um, of these discussions of kind of a continuum of skills, right? It, it doesn't fall easily into separate groups. So one thing that I stole here is kind of a software engineer on the one side, that's kind of the person who builds systems. And at the very far end is a, maybe a research scientist, so a researcher who takes data, typically some linear regression um, to identify correlations, um, to identify insights, right? And then the applied scientist has more be more of a, not just pure interest in the data, but wants to find something and apply it to something. A data scientist is maybe more involved and a data engineer might be closer to somebody who actually focuses on kind of dealing with data, uh, maybe a bit more closer to the software engineering side. Um, does this roughly make sense? So there are lots of these discussions out there. Um, and one thing that I brought up in the beginning is this notion of a unicorn um, in hiring. So those are the people, the people who are 
have both software engineering skills, domain skills, and machine learning skills are often called kind of unicorns. They are the specialist, or they are the people that can do everything, that have deep expertise in everything. And the problem is that we have very few of those. There are some people who are known to be really great at this, and those are the people that everybody tries to hire and keep, right? But most of the time, people kind of are experts in one or the other domain. Um, and it's questionable whether we can actually get everybody to have deep expertise in every topic. So there are a couple of graphics like this. I, I dislike this one specifically, um, but it's widely shared um, as kind of a, an overview of how different disciplines or different expertise fit together. And unicorn is essentially the description for somebody who's in the middle, who has a domain expertise, is a software engineer, knows the fundamentals of computer science and math and statistics, and is a researcher and everything essentially. Right? But again, in reality, and I like the arrogance of putting everything into this data science circle, um, that all of this is data science, but anyway. Um, Let's not go there. So you read this discussion of data scientists at um, Microsoft, right? Um, also this discussion, I think, this is maybe a little bit more biased because those are data scientists on software teams. So they are often maybe a little bit closer already to products, but you saw that they have very different notions of, of kind of tasks, right? So you have a lot of people who are analyzing product and customer data, who are looking at what do people like, uh, kind of from telemetry, how satisfied are they? Are they coming to uh, renew their subscription? But there's also a lot of kind of data scientists that work directly on software problems. This is kind of the machine learning for uh, code or machine learning for software engineering field uh, of bug prioritization, um, bug prediction monitoring, um, and then also, some people who work on business problems and domain specific problems. You saw in that paper that people were classified again into different, even the data scientists in there kind of were classified into different groups. Do you remember some of them? How did some of the people specialize? Um, I remember one was polymath. Uh, those were the guys who could do everything. Right, that's their version of unicorn, I think. Right. Anything else? Evangelists, I think these are the people who were, um, who would not figure out these data, but they were taking decisions from the data. I remember it correctly. Right, or more of a manager type, right, um, who gets involved, who really want to uh, spread information, right. And there were also discussions, so those were the, the terms that they used. Um, does anybody remember any of the other ones and how they specialized? I think one of the, uh, not sure which role, maybe the data analyzer uh, who was responsible for doing exploratory analysis, uh, kind of go through the data to find out patterns or something. Mm -hmm. um, I remember platform builders were the software engineers who would who would do the telemetry part and uh, right and specifically to support other data scientists right kind of ml ops uh, that kind of thing right they had some roles of um, data preparer as somebody who focuses mostly on collecting data and maybe um, cleaning data, although that's data shaper, I think, in their analysis. There are some people who specialize mostly in kind of cleaning and feature engineering. Um, right, and then there are a bunch of people who just do this on the side, right, with overlapping with other activities, the moonlighters. Um, I think the, the main point here is just to show that even when I'm just breaking things down into data scientists and software engineers, this is extremely nuanced inside each group again, right? People specialize. And I looked up a couple of other uh, descriptions and there are a bunch of them. So kind of data scientist, data analyst, data architect, data engineer, statistician, um, and then people on the database side or the business side and so on. This was 2015. And then here's a more recent, um, posting, again, thinking about these are blog posts of how you can specialize in 
what, if you want to go into data science, what are the things that you can do? Right? Product data analyst, business intelligence, uh, modeling analyst, which is, has to do with financial forecasting mostly, machine learning engineer, somebody who focuses on applications. So this is kind of classifying this a little bit by who the end user is. Right? Who are you doing this for? Are you trying to build an application? Are you trying to support the business? Um, and then some um, data visualization expert I thought was interesting as somebody who's really analyzes data to tell a story to convince others, which is maybe the evangelist. Um, and then the last role again, supporting and kind of tool and platform builder. Um, this again aligns with people who do more kind of sciencey things and people who do more product building things and that's fairly di diverse there as well. Um, let's see, what roles would you identify among software engineers? That's also not a homogeneous group, I guess, right? What are the different, what are some of the different specializations Like requirements, analyst, tester, uh, I don't know, just broad developer, mm -hmm. uh, probably some infrastructure people. Yep. Things like that. I think also the front end, back end distinction makes sense. Some DevOps specialists, some uh, database engineers or um, operators. Maybe you could separate those from kind of Stop engineering. There's, there's kind of a question where you draw the line, right? Um, also at some point, maybe product managers, software architects, right? So again, you have a large number of different kind of specialties. Um, all right, the, yeah. The point when I'm talking about this is that for building systems, and I should have also put the TikTok thing here, um, we kind of need expertise from different areas, right? And we probably need expertise in different areas of software engineering and in different areas of data science as well. And then again, there's a question, do we find somebody who can do it all? Who can do the databases, the front end, the back end, the DevOps, the um, testing, uh, the architecture, the data engineering, the um, model building, right? The financial forecasting, the um, building the platform, the ML ops and so on. What do we in practice actually have to build teams that consists of people with different specialties, right? So you can only get that far with few people. At some point you actually need expertise from multiple different disciplines when you're building these projects, right? You can think of You'd certainly need somebody who really knows about natural language processing in this part, right? And who knows about deep neural networks and audio transcription. Um, but you also need somebody who is good at user interface design and actually building a web app and scaling it in distributed systems. Um, but now we talked about software engineers and data scientists and all their special roles. What other people do you need in a project? If you actually want to build a product. Business analysts, some managers, probably. A legal team, yeah. Testers, designers, consultants for what? For our expertise. <laughs> Uh, ethics consultants, yeah. Um, user surrogates, somebody who might provide test inputs, right? Um, yeah, I think this covers also what I thought about mostly, maybe UI experts, operations people as well, some lawyers, maybe you might not get away with out, um, right? Um, so, so, Again, kind of building a product is more complicated than just writing the software, right? Or writing the model. And you really need to 
at the system perspective, you need to make a business case um, if you want to have this as a product. You need to look at requirements broadly with all kinds of different things like safety, ethics, um, fairness, security that we talked about. Um, you really need to think about in a machine learning project where do you get the data from, what kind of data can we get, um, what data do we have, right? How can we engineer it? Um, you need to think about the, pro about the entire process. You need to think about quality assurance and operation. So I'm kind of repeating myself, but I think you get the point. We need teams, right? And we typically need teams that have multiple different expertise in there. Um, so instead of just unicorns, we need people from different races together. We also need to do this typically just to scale um, size, but teams have issues. And I wanna go through some team issues. So those have been broadly studied. So I'm not talking about anything new here. And a lot of this has been recognized and we're going to talk about a bunch of interventions. So first example, or first thing I wanna talk about are process costs. Um, so just off the top of your head, um, how many people do you think we would need for this um, social media detecting depression on TikTok feature? How big of a team would you assign for this? All right, there's some priming happening, but still, um, I see numbers between five and 50 so far. Um, Daniel, you want to justify your five? How, what, what kind of people would you put on the team? <laughs> sure. Um, so I was thinking some one person in the sort of leadership management escrow oversight the direction of the project, uh, probably one senior developer who's kind of just um, you know, more senior and, and kind of broad development expertise. You probably want one person who's more domain specific, so lots of sentiment uh, knowledge. And then, uh, what am I at, uh, four? And then one sort of junior person just to do some work. <laughs> <laughs> to do the extra work, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Jake, Jake, do you want to think about a little bit? Um, yeah. Yeah, so most of mine would not be developers either. I'm, I'm just thinking that, yeah, uh, you know, maybe you'd have a, a technical manager um, and a business analyst and, um, you know, somewhere two to five, a, a team of developers. And then the rest would be um, some of the other, other miscellaneous roles. A lot of it, I think, would be um, basically acquiring and, and engineering the data to a good format and cleaning it and, and all the kinds of things we talked about just to make sure we have a good reliable set and having um, testers and QA. Mm -hmm. um, I just, that those people would be cheaper to pay the salaries for, but there'd be a lot more of them in this okay. I, I picture. But also, yeah, clinical professionals maybe, right? Yes, um, yes. A bunch of those. Um, researchers, if we want to involve them, some you, you kind of all left out the machine learning specialist maybe. Um, to some degree, right? We probably want the bunch there um, or, or some. Um, right. I have a couple of pictures here just to give you a sense of different team sizes, right? And how this might scale. So Twitter was founded with three people in the beginning, um, kind of friends. And this is easy. Maybe you have an office, right? You kind of just communicate everybody in one room um, or one Slack channel, I don't know. Um, Instagram, when it was acquired in 2012 for 1 billion, had 13 employees. Um, this is 15 here, I think. Um, so this is still, I think, something where you can think about a fairly cohesive team. But then if you start going to 50 or 200 people, which is not unusual for a company, uh, for even for a startup company, right? Um, you need to think about, so if you want to do an all-hands meeting, this is what this might look like. Right, this is a lot of people, so you probably don't want to communicate with everybody about every decision. So you need to start thinking about some structure. Um, so this is not actually representative of any real teams. I was just looking for for pictures with lots of people, right? And then this is a picture of um, about 1,200 people, um, which was two or three years ago the size of Uber's. 
uh, technology team, right? So at this point, when you have like 1,200 people, you really need some sort of structure, right? So you can't talk with everybody. Um, one of the old results is kind of Brooks' law um, by Frederick Brooks um, after saying adding manpower to a late software projects make, makes it later. Right? So this is broadly accepted. Uh, I suspect this has been studied also, but nobody kind of questions this really. Um, what causes the effect? Why is this? a problem kind of adding people to a late team? I think onboarding is like one of the most expensive processes. Yep, kind of training them, knowledge transfer. So if you're already behind and then you're bringing in extra people, that's one thing. Also just bringing in more and more people, um, why might this also not be a good idea? but talked about process cost earlier. Why are really small teams sometimes much more effective than larger teams? The, the code may not be, the, the writing of the code may not be parallelizable. If a lot of the changes need to happen in a small percentage of the code, you're not gonna be able to subdivide it and, and have everyone working on non-conflicting portions. Mm -hmm. Yep. Vivek, what do you mean by communication scale? Um, so in a larger team, it's very tough to uh, tell about the vision and what's going in the project, essentially. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very tough to manage that, whereas in smaller teams, it's much easier. Right, so if, you, if you're sitting in the same room and you can just ask your colleague about or tell them what you're doing, right? Or even if you have a few rooms and you can still have a stand-up meeting, that's very different than if you're starting to introduce hierarchy and uh, some form of organization mechanism. Right, so the problem is that uh, the number of communication links scales quadratically with the number of developers, right? So if you add one more person and you don't have any structure, they're talking to everybody else. If you're talking, adding one more person, it adds a link for everybody, right? So, and at some point, large organizations tend to have a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of meetings to get just everybody on the, on the same page. So typically what we do is we divide large projects into smaller teams, and then we make somebody responsible for the communication between the teams. Right, so that not everybody on every team needs to know what everybody else is doing, but some people have some, have the larger picture in mind. They know what the individual teams are doing and are coordinating where needed. Uh, and then the teams are communicating with, within each other and are more effective. That's the ideal setting at least, right? Uh, what are some of the problems with this kind of approach? Duplication of efforts, uh, siloing, right? So the developers may not know what everybody else is doing and the managers, the coordinators may not be aware in sufficient detail at the lower level, right? So you might see duplication. What else? at point of failures in terms of communication, right? So if you have some people who are bad at communicating, this might drag down the entire team. It's a little kind of bit of a telephone game where there's some information lost in the, in the process. Yeah. And, and in general, right, um, there, there are arguments against hierarchies that people on the top might be too far away from what is actually happening, right? And people at the bottom don't feel like their voices are heard and so on. So there's a lot of discussion around what's a good size for a team, a software team. And there have been many different um, designs and I'm not sure how far back I should go. So this is maybe interesting from Brooke um, when he wrote about this mythic amendments um, problem. What he was suggesting was surgical teams, which is 
looks really weird from today's perspective. It's essentially, you have a chief programmer who does most of the programming in the initial documentation, and then each programmer has a staff of eight or so people who kind of support the chief programmer. Right? So it's kind of very specifically one person and then a bunch of people who help. Copilot is um, somebody who helps and represents the programmer in team meetings. That sounds nice. Um, right? uh, you have some administrators, you have an editor who edits the documentation, although this chief programmer is uh, responsible to write the initial documentation, it's so important. Two secretaries, a program clerk, um, which would be today a version control system, a toolsmith who writes specialized tools for this programmer, a tester, language lawyer would be a compiler these days, I guess. Um, Sounds a little bit weird, right? There's this whole focus on one person. This is kind of the, the unicorn uh, story again. You have a few people who are kind of good at everything or the 10X story uh, that you have just some people that are so much better than everybody else. It fosters a little bit of arrogance and hierarchy. Um, I, I mean, you can try it, whether you find 10 people to support you in what you're doing as a, as a programmer or if you start a company, but I think this is, this is maybe not what we're going for these, these days. Um, most companies talk about small team practices. Um, it's raining pretty badly. I'm not sure whether he hears this on the microphone. Um, so um, Microsoft talked about how they're doing small teams and give them a lot of autonomy. Um, a newer version would be probably Spotify that's copied a lot, that has this kind of small team culture with a lot of independence. Um, that can take their own risks. Um, so in Microsoft, they had three to eight developers on a team and then another three to eight testers and a program manager and the uh, product manager that would kind of coordinate things. Um, Agile practices typically recommends like seven people in a team, right? And we haven't really figured out how to do larger things than teams of teams, really. Um, the question for us is, and there's lots of uh, examples like this, how small teams are more effective than large teams. There are lots and lots of stories. Maybe there's, those are just anecdotes, um, but lots of examples where um, large teams create six times as many effects as small teams and obviously burn through a lot more money, yet the large team appears to produce about the same amount of output in, in, in not much less time. Right, and um, this this kind of fits over and over again. Like large teams, like small teams tend to be more effective. But then again, didn't I have a slide for this somewhere? Um, but then again, you just said we want to have maybe 50 people on, on this project, right? Which means you need to start thinking about smaller teams even for a project like this. And you not need to start thinking about if we want to have all these different forms of expertise here, like, um, like a healthcare professional and a machine learning professional and a DevOps person and a software engineer and maybe another software engineer and maybe um, an expert on, on uh, a lawyer and so on, right? How big is your team growing? How can you, how can you design this? So, the typical um, recommendations are, well, you need some hierarchy at some point, or at least some structure of teams of teams and kind of assign different responsibilities. Typically, um, have you heard of Conway's law before? Um, that's the idea that uh, the organization structure should align with the code structure, otherwise you have a problem. Um, Here's an example. So if, if the circuits are modules and the um, lines are connections, oh, no, wait, those are people and uh, who's talking to each other. So we have two teams and this, this team is responsible for part of module A and module B and this other team is, part, is responsible for all three modules to some part. This is not a very congruent structure, right? Because the team structure does not align with the source code structure. Actually, for module A, there are two 
there are people from two teams responsible. So for every change within that module, they need to coordinate. In module B, again, two peop uh, people from two teams are responsible. Uh, they need to coordinate. They don't even have a direct link, right? So they would co coordinate through their managers. Um, this is dangerous. This um, creates additional overhead. So what you often want is that you kind of decompose this, uh, the, the software into modules in some form, like front and back end, microservices these days, um, and then assign individual teams to each project, right? Never two teams to the same module. One, one team might cover multiple modules, uh, and then have clear interfaces between them, right? So you separate the software along interfaces and you separate teams along interfaces. And if you have a problem with that module, you can go to that team. Does it make sense? Any idea how you would structure in this specific example teams? Let's, let's assume we're not getting away with five people. Maybe we don't need JX50, but maybe somewhere in the middle, um, Vivek suggested 25. So let's say we have 25 people. Um, so we need maybe three, four teams, something like this. How would you, how would you structure this? Maybe if, if we were looking top down, one thing we could think about is the um, machine learning pipeline. Um, I'm, that might not be comprehensive of everything we need to do, but we could start, you know, with have people to do the data acquisition and people at the other end to build the, follow, the, the final models. And, and you could, and that way you'd have your um, functional separation because you'd mm -hmm. have people for the, the subdivided pipeline. That sounds plausible to me that somebody is really responsible for, for kind of getting past data annotated, right? Identifying um, diagnosed users and their activities or getting other data, helping with labeling and cleaning. Mm -hmm. What would other teams do? Or what would be other structures? Um, one thing which I have seen in my previous work experience, they they have teams uh, which collect the data. Essentially, they they pull the data from everywhere and store it at one place. Then there is one team that analyzes that data. Those were called data analysts, at least uh, in my work environment. Then there was one team which were like machine learning experts. They would take all this data that has been analyzed and build models on the basis of that. And then there was one team which was working on the infrastructure part of everything. Okay. So, so again, along the pipeline kind of plus a team that provides the infrastructure, you left out software engineers kind of, but um, except for the infrastructure, but somebody who integrates this into TikTok, yeah. right? So you probably have some front end and some back end engineers there that you might split. You might think of this detection feature as a separate microservice, right? So somebody developing an endpoint for this and then a different team integrating this into the, the rest of the product, thinking about how to do the advertisement or the small group features. Interestingly, I think what you discussed so far was mostly splitting um, data scientists and software engineers into separate teams. Right. We're coming back to this in a second. Um, right. So a different team issue that I want to talk about is having multiple and conflicting goals. Um, this is kind of the back, the basis for DevOps, right? So where you had developers and operators who had different goals, like an operator would try to keep the system running, and a developer wants to push new features out quickly, right? Gets things into production, gets things used, and those are not necessarily aligning particularly well, right? So 
the, the bringing out features quickly does not necessarily mean that they are highest quality and easy to operate in production or to operate with low resources, right? And DevOps does a lot to kind of share responsibility. And um, I think we talked about this earlier. What, what are some of the conflicting goals that you might expect between data scientists and software engineers? Accuracy versus efficiency, right? So one team builds a very high accurate solution, even though it's stupidly expensive to run and operate. Yeah, training on more data and how long it takes, right? So the time it takes to update, um, anything else? It's very abstract, but building better models versus building better systems, um, right? So, and I think we talked about a bunch of other things like evaluating accuracy across the board versus looking at things like fairness, at safety cases, at different, different forms of different test cases, right? Um, thinking about, yeah, efficiency we already talked about, different, um, model size you kind of talked about, but all kinds of different quality, right? Thinking about debugging of the system later, um, building a more accurate model that's harder to debug, uh, that's maybe harder to operate. So a bunch of these. Um, maybe that's easy, but um, what might be a conflict between kind of a data scientist and a lawyer in a company? Yeah, how much do you anonymize data, right? How much do you not collect data because of privacy issues? How much do you protect your models? Um, right, mostly around privacy, uh, some around security. What can you do um, and be legally allowed to do? How can you phrase the software? Things like this, right? Um, So what, what might you see in this TikTok case? Um, what are different roles? So data scientists and uh, software engineers probably have a bunch of similar things where maybe the data scientists want to be the most accurate and the software engineers want to run this maybe in some reasonable cost or the operators want to run this with some reasonable cost. Uh, what are other things that you could see here? Other roles maybe that might be in conflict um, yeah, ethical consent of how, how to present this to the users, how to, it's a sensitive topic, right? So how do you present this? How do you get the data? Um, what else? How might business people have a different opinion or the medical health professionals? the advertisers. Yeah, having a flashy win for marketing rather than a scientifically correct result. Good idea. You might actually lose advertisement if you implement this, right? And at some point you need to set a threshold at what point do you detect um, depression? Are you only going for the very sure cases that you don't lose a lot of advertisers or advertising money? Or are you going more broadly because you want to um, go for more, for more impact, right? So I think there's a, there's a lot of trade-offs and different people in different roles may have different opinions. And the problem is again, if they are on different teams, this might be harder to coordinate and to agree. Right? They might be actually working with each other. It might be harder to coordinate. So how can you address goal conflicts? How do you negotiate all of these issues that we talked about?
Actually, let, let me try something that I did in the earlier lectures and then didn't do anymore. Um, or type something, type an answer, think about what you could do, but don't send it yet. And kind of do thumbs up or so when you've written something. I want you all to think about if you have people with conflicting goals in different teams, in different roles, right? How can you bring them closer together? Maybe there's something that we can learn from DevOps, right? This has worked where we brought developers and operators together. What are other strategies to bring people with different roles and different incentives better together? So type your answer, don't write it yet, don't send it yet, and then uh, say yes when you're done. So how do you get the business people to work together with the data scientists or the marketing people or the uh, ethics people or the security team? I'm waiting for a few more yeses. Two more. All right, click send. So have a common organizational goal, have a vision for, for the organization or for the larger project. Um, right, so a lot of this is management. Um, advocate for, for each uh, role in a team meeting, set communication goals, right? Be clear about this, uh, show the conflict, um, have an owner, a product owner who makes a final decision, who adds, acts at the bridge, right? Um, invite these kind of discussions have, have right. Um, maybe try multiple things, um, see which one actually works, right? So there, there are a bunch of strategies. Um, one thing that I think you didn't talk about is have people that can actually understand each other's concern. Um, one hiring strategy is sometimes called hire T-shaped people. So you don't only want to hire people who are experts at exactly one thing, and not only generalists that kind of know a little bit of everything, but people who have this T-shape that they are expert in one area, for example, machine learning expert, but they also understand the fairness literature or they understand the concern of, um, um, of deploying the thing, right? Or you have a software engineer that actually knows what the problem with all the data is or how you would test this. So I think this is one of the strategies to build teams of people with different expertise, but overlapping kind of vocabulary, right? So um, to, to find people who, who you can compose that you cover all the team or the areas that you need, even in separate teams, but ideally within the scene, but then foster communication. This is by the way, one way that I think about this course of helping people on one side or the other side to, to see the other side, not necessarily to completely do the data science part as a software engineer or do uh, all the software engineering as a data scientist, but be broad enough that you understand the concept that you can talk to those people, that you can understand this. I think this was one of the key um, steps in DevOps that you created mutual awareness of the respective problems, right? Um, also help to, to uh, create 
joint goals, right? Don't create different incentives, but have joint incentives, right? And shared responsibility. In team organizations, more classically, there are these different views of how you organize teams. Um, the traditional organization is kind of a matrix organization where you have different departments. So you have the machine learning group, you have the system programmer group, you have the tester group, you have the security group and the marketing group. And whenever you do a project like this initiative uh, to address mental health issues, um, you kind of grab people from these different departments and bring them together in a team. The problem with this approach is that these, all these individuals have two bosses typically. They have one in their department and they have the project lead. They're sometimes working on multiple projects at the same time, which can be challenging. Uh, but there is value in having a dedicated department where all the security people or the, the machine learning people know each other and can talk to each other rather than being spread out. Right? The alternative common approach is a project organization where you assign people to a project and they don't have a home department, right? So the projects are covering people from all different departments essentially, but they belong to the project. And once the project is done, you essentially redistribute the people to other projects. Uh, they're not necessarily going home to their home department. Um, there are a couple of trade-offs between those two um, and there are a couple of um, mixed methods here. So. Um, in a centralized, um, there's lots of stories how, how it's complicated to deal with multiple bosses. And if you have kind of a studio or a kind of project organization, you can focus much more um, on the project, right? So you don't have the overlap. But the disadvantage with this is if you only need like a fifth of a security person on your team, um, do you want a security person on your team the entire time? Do you consult with somebody? And then you have kind of a hybrid organization. And so for specialists, there are a couple of ways to organize them. Uh, this could be machine learning specialists or software engineering specialists on the machine learning project or um, security people is often talked about. So in a centralized kind of organization, you have um, a group of specialists like a security department or a machine learning department, and they consult with the development teams. Distributed would be the project organizations where you have a security specialist on every team at home. Um, and then you have some hybrid models where they have a home organization, like the matrix organization, where they have a home, um, but they also work on the teams or they're borrowed to the teams. What are the trade-offs? Why would you pick one over the other of these organizations? Let's see. Let's say you have a you have a machine learning project, and you need some software engineering expertise. Somebody who who can look into requirements, into feedback loops, and maybe safety. Um, would you have a kind of software engineering department? Would you have a software engineer on every team? Would you have some hybrid organization? Why would you prefer one or the other? Um, hybrid, uh, in terms of availab availability, it's better. Um, so if you are having software engineer in your own team, in the machine learning team, um, that software engineer is dedicated for your own work. Um, whereas if you are asking for software engineering work from any other team, uh, the availability becomes an issue. Like the other team may say, we don't have time and things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, one disadvantage which uh, I have felt is like managing such teams is a problem. The goals of people are different. The work that they do are different. So uh, managers may be biased towards certain things. Mm -hmm. Right, so if you're actually on the team, like in the distributed fashion, you're much more involved with the team, right? This is, I think, what YT is trying to say. Um, if you 
distribute people into the teams and they have very specialized expertise, um, they might be less inclined to keep up with news. Right? So if you have somebody on DevOps and who's part of the team, they might not talk to all the other DevOps people or ML ops people and on different teams kind of to, to see the latest developments. This is where hybrid organization makes sense, right? Where at least the, the specialists network um, and it depends a lot on, on kind of how important the role is, right? Whether you want like only 20% of the time of a person to consult, but then they're working on multiple teams or whether you can hire them full time on your team, right? Um, and again, um, Often it's better to have specialists that can help out and have everybody else have some awareness. So this is for security where this has been studied and this is after a bunch of back and forth, this is what a lot of people, including Microsoft, handed up on. Uh, you want some security awareness for everybody on the team, right? Not everybody becomes a security specialist. We don't want unicorn, everybody to turn into unicorns, but they need to buy into the process and then you want specialists that kind of come and help out, right? They're either on the team and can talk to everybody or they can come and help out on a, on a time to time basis. So here again, we can think about, so you divided um, actually the larger teams into smaller teams that were mostly sorted into data scientists or software engineers. That's fine, right? But the, the larger organization needs some structure to align goals and to enable some communication here. Um, and it's kind of parts projects in a larger project, uh, yeah, teams in a larger project probably. Um, it helps to not avoid conflict, to actually expose all views, uh, to come to a decision, but then to commit on it and uh, assign responsibility. There's a lot of literature on conflict management and how to detect conflict um, and conflicting goals. Um, there are a couple of agile development techniques that are actually addressing this kind of stuff fairly directly. So I assume most of you are familiar with a lot of agile development techniques. Which of those help with teamwork if you have kind of to bring everybody on the same level to avoid kind of conflicting goals, things like this. Does sprint planning do it a little? Because everybody on the team has some input over what you're doing yep. a little bit. Yeah, everybody has a larger goal, right? And then you're, as a team, you're developing or you're dividing the work. Um, Stand-up meetings help to kind of keep in touch, right? To see what people are doing. Anything else? Um, also, uh, I'm just wondering, does prioritization help here? Uh, in terms of even though the team members may have different goals, there is another authority, which is product owner, who is deciding on the priority of the work. Mm -hmm. So you must follow according to that. So, so you're talking about an on-site customer or, or some of those techniques? Yeah. Uh, so you can have an on-site customer or you can have a product owner within the company yes. who is dealing with the product. Right. So, so that's another strategy where you have somebody to kind of set the higher goal, right? And mediate conflict, right? If you have the customer actually on site, um, right? So there, there are a bunch of these. Um, and actually, this is not surprising. A lot of agile techniques are really supporting group work in different forms, right? Um, two more group issues, but I think I might only get to this one. Um, group think. Does anybody have examples of groupthink in software projects or machine learning projects? So first of all, groupthink, I think the comic explains it quite well, right? Is if a group never disagrees on something where you essentially don't question any decisions, you just follow often the manager or, or somebody blindly, right? To well, follow the crowd. What might be some, some examples of groupthink? 
in software projects. Yeah, story point estimation. So in general, um, time estimation, the first person giving a number, um, it's very, it's priming everybody and people might not actually question that. Other examples? I don't know if this, this counts, but like code reviews, there's a lot of like, um, well, you did the code, so it's probably good, or this yep. person looked at it, so it's probably good. Yep. Group thing, maybe with regard to security. So I like what Jake says that we're just using deep learning without thinking why, right? We were just following the hype. Everybody is doing deep learning and maybe we actually need explainability or some of those issues. Um, not addressing technical debt. Uh, we need more features. We need more features. We don't think about this. Right? I think those are all fair examples. Right? So group thing is the idea of minimizing group conflicts, kind of increasing cohesion, um, avoid exploring alternatives, suppressing dissenting views, and then uh, isolating yourself from outside influences. There are lots of examples in business, like Swiss Air is a famous one, which was called the Flying Bank, like a super solid airline until it suddenly went bankrupt. So everybody was just thinking, oh, we are the best airline ever. And they were not looking for warning signs and they were um, actually not realizing that they had um, problems. So this often leads to irrational and dysfunctional decision-making. Right? So cost and time estimation is a very classic example as well. Um, use of hype technology in all forms, right? Machine learning, you just throw machine learning at a problem because everybody is doing it now. Uh, might be rational, but if that's the way that you get um, funding as a startup, right? Even though it's just put this in the title, but um, using this actually, um, there was a time where everybody put blockchain, did something with blockchain, right? Or everybody needed to put agile into a project, um, DevOps, AI ops, things like this. So just doing this because everybody is doing this without questioning this as a form of group thing, right? Um, so causes are typically that you have high group cohesiveness, high homogeneity, um, and you avoid conflict. So there are structural faults as well that you have insulation, you don't talk to others, to talk to other groups, or you don't have a, a, a way of exploring the design space, um, or you're just under stress um, and don't want to think, right? So you, you don't think about more broadly. And the symptoms are usually um, overestimation of ability. So you, this is the Swiss bank example. Again, they felt invulnerable. They didn't question this. Uh, they think they are moral. Whatever they're doing, they can't really go wrong. Um, and then being closed minded, ignore warnings, ignore stereotyping, um, kind of pressure toward uniformity, self-censor or push out dissenting opinions. Um, but self-censorship is actually much more important that people come to meetings, uh, they, hear somebody saying something like we should do machine learning and they might not agree, but they don't speak up um, because uh, they, they, they know what they're doing or I don't want to be fired. And so this is kind of well known in tech. Um, the example here, where's this from? I never made it past the first episode uh, of Silicon Valley. Um, but I mean, it plays with the stereotype image, right? Uh, big uniformity, low on diversity, which is very common form of uh, leading to group think. Um, so diversity is one way of trying to address this. There are lots of studies on this uh, showing that diverse teams are better at problem solving. They are looking at problems from different angles. Um, we, this came up multiple times throughout the lectures, um, for example, in safety issues, had nobody thought about possible uh, um, disabled users, wheelchair users with the robot when they are doing the route planning. They actually had involved some disability groups 
in their planning, at least they claimed. Um, there are lots of examples of technology that doesn't work well for certain groups, right? We talked about bias and unfairness, um, and you might avoid some of this maybe if you have some more diverse teams. Um, but there's also the article that you read from um, um, about fairness practices um, that even if you hire more diverse teams, you probably, that alone will not be a fix. You, you won't be able to represent everybody on every team. So you need also ways to, um, to think beyond that, but this is a good start. Um, so what could be forms of groupthink in the TikTok case? What could be things where you made make bad decisions because you're avoiding conflict, because you have a very non-diverse, homogeneous team. Um, any ideas, anything that comes to mind? Defining a label for depression, having a very narrow or very negative view of depression, potentially. That probably helps if they're working with healthcare professionals, right? Um, but yeah, this is, this is a problem that people who don't have experience this in their life might have a very biased view of this, right? So actually having somebody on the team who has struggled with depression might actually be helpful to have some perspective on the team, right? The first-hand account. Um, right, different cultures have different views of mental illness. There might be um, certain biases. You might just go in doing this with sentiment analysis because everybody uses sentiment analysis or that's the thing that everybody on the team has used in the past. Right, so maybe there's a better technique. Maybe the manager suggests a certain intervention <clears throat> like uh, showing ads for getting help, but, and nobody speaks against this because it's the manager that suggested this or even the CEO, right? Um, but there are medically much more efficient ways maybe than just showing you an ad, do you have depression? Here's, here's how you get help. Maybe there's better ways of doing this, but you might not explore them because you didn't look at different solutions. Anything else? Um, yeah, I think we talked about most of these. So one more time, what might be mitigation strategies? Um, how can you reduce groupthink? You can think of agile techniques, but also other things. Um, should I make you type first again? Let's do this one more time. Please all type and say yes when you're done. Um, more diverse hiring is, is one thing you could write maybe obvious after what I've shown, but uh, maybe you have other ideas, um, maybe some agile techniques, maybe some uh, management techniques, maybe some teamwork techniques that can help you to break group think. Type your answer, say yes when you're done. Doesn't have to be in the TikTok case, can be more general, but maybe also you have ideas specifically for the TikTok case. Can I get one more? Okay. 
All right, press enter. All right, let's so create a climate where people actually speak out. Um, well, this is a climate thing, right? Which you can do as a manager um, where it's not penalized, where you actually encourage conflict up to a point. Um, shuffling team members, yeah, have different perspective. Anonymous feedback, if there's no climate to speak out otherwise. Um, different interviewing practices, hire more um, diverse teams, um, have more, um, yeah, have more fair meetings or kind of prevent one dominant person. It's actually a common recommendation to have the boss not speak in a meeting or not even be present often, or at least not speak first because this might bias everybody. Um, let everybody explain the rationale and just, just reaching consensus quickly, right? Um, Maybe one-on-one -on -one communication with the manager, um, socialize with the team outside of work, yep. Um, so there's, there's actually a lot of research on this. Um, and I just have a rough summary here um, of a couple of directions. So diversity in team composition, right? Hiring and how you compose teams and how you think about this. Um, a culture of open conflicts. This t takes some getting used to, but kind of saying that conflict at least up to the point is actually healthy you want to see different rules appoint a devil's advocate in a discussion so every in every meeting you have one person who's supposed to poke holes on this and then if he if that person does it um, it's not perceived as kind of a negative thing right or it's normalized um, moderate and rotate speaker order right that you don't have the leaders only starting and doing things involve outside experts. Um, always request a second solution. Never go with the first one unless you explore alternatives. Um, right, and then Agile has a bunch of techniques. Again, um, planning poker helps. Um, On-site customer might help to some point to provide an outside perspective. Right, planning poker is the idea that everybody writes down time estimates before they show them to others to avoid biasing each other. Um, things like this. All right. Anything else on t uh, group think? I only have a few minutes, but now this is my last point. I don't want to go too, too deep into this. Social loafing is also a very commonly studied team phenomenon. I'm not sure how common it is on software teams. Um, the, the issue here is it has been very well shown that the more people you have on a team, the smaller the individual contributions. It's very easy to hide in a team. And there are actually lots of funny experiments. So on rope pulling contests, the more people you have on a team, the lower the individual contribution, right? So if you have fewer people, people pull harder. Um, this has been replicated with clapping and with cheering. So if you have a group of people that are all clapping or all cheering as loud as they can, the larger the group, uh, the lower the result. Um, this is very common that um, the, most, the main reasons here are kind of diffusion of responsibility. If there are few people, you're responsible for this. And if there are more people, you can hide in a crowd. It's also, you get less recognition because it's, you're one of many people who contributed to the success, right? So you're not individually pointed out and recognized. Um, and then if you actually experience that you're pulling everybody, then you don't want to be the sucker who pulls everybody and you're also tired back. This is actually very common on student teams. I have no idea about your teams, but you have a reflection coming up if you want to write about something like this. Um, but you probably have seen teams where you have seen some of those effects. Um, what can you do about it? Let's not do the waiting for everybody step, just any ideas? Smaller teams is one thing. Right, smaller teams are um, are helping to avoid this diffusion of responsibility. For academics, peer grading might help. 
um, that will only go so far inside a company, right? You have staff evaluation, but yeah. Right, so subdividing the work into smaller tasks is a very common thing that you actually can recognize the contributions of individual people, they can't hide as much, right? So the whole idea of kind of Kanban boards or sprints kind of breaking it into smaller pieces helps people to give um, a specific um, recognition for tasks and responsibilities for tasks. Um, Right, stand-up meetings, kind of showing what has everybody been doing, right, gives recognition, gives, um, um, gives visibility to tasks, this might help. Um, I'm not sure, so the research on incentives is actually mostly showing that incentives don't work. Um, so if you, if you threaten to fire people quickly or if you try to pay them more for certain things, um, bonuses, um, that's actually not a great incentive. Um, let me actually slide for this. Um, that's actually not a great incentive for um, creative workers. This works if you have somebody who works on an assembly line or at McDonald's or something like a very routine job. But for creative people, they are not motivated by pay after a certain amount and bonuses don't really help. And bonuses actually make uh, have a weird effect that they eliminate intrinsic motivation and you game for extrinsic motivation. You, do, you start doing things for the money to focus specifically on some goals and not because you want to do them and you enjoy your work less and you're less motivated and might actually work less. Um, this book is very interesting, Daniel Pink um, describing the motivation or what drives people and he breaks it down into essentially autonomy, mastery and purpose. Creative people, which applies to essentially all software projects, um, are driven if they have autonomy. Um, Spotify, you know, Netflix is extremely well known for this, giving people um, high autonomy and that they can choose and do and take risks and so on. They're also a company that fires people fairly quickly if they're not the top, on the top of the game, but the autonomy can be extremely motivating. Mastery, if you're actually a specialist in something, if you can actually take pride of your uh, work, if you can go deep into something, that's something that motivates people. The 10,000 hour rule, you spend 10,000 hours on something to become an expert in something and be proud of it. And in purpose, um, doing something that you believe in, have a mission behind this, which might actually work with a mental health project, for example, right? Where you're not just making the company money, but you're actually doing something that you're proud of. Um, so in general, all of these things that you mentioned help with uh, mitigating um, social loafing, right? So smaller tasks involve everybody, make, uh, make things recognizable, uh, identifiable, smaller teams, reviews, feedback, uh, things like this. That's all I had today. Um, so I wanted to talk about kind of in general more teamwork, but focus specifically, we talked about, we started talking about uh, data scientists and software engineers and who else you might need in a project for building these projects, right? And that you have very interdisciplinary teams and there are a bunch of problems um, that typically come up with these, right? Uh, conflicting goals, process costs, group thing. You kind of need to think about how to structure teams um, and things like this. There's lots more reading on this. You kind of tend to go into management and business le uh, literature, um, but there's lots of things that can actually be learned and applied in, in designing teams and thinking about this. <laughs>